And as we transition to our next session, we wanted to give a few minutes to a special guest. The NASA Marshall Partnerships Forum took place yesterday. And here to say a few words about it, Reggie Alexander, manager at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center's Partnerships and Formulation Office. Reggie, come on up. Yeah, as we're in the transition, I wanted to just make a, a couple of notes, or, uh, or at least bring to your attention uh, the Marshall Partnerships Forum. Uh, we we did meet on on Tuesday, and we had an all day session. And the objective, if you'll go forward a slide, uh, the objective of the Partnerships Forum uh, is to um, is an opportunity for our partner to community to learn about the things that we can do at Marshall in terms of capabilities and facilities. Also to learn about how to partner at Marshall um, and also understand the activities, the programs, the policies that may uh, impact the partnership initiatives that we have. And so we, we certainly wanna reach out to all who uh, might be interested in partnering with us, particularly uh, commercial business development uh, and engineers, other government agencies and academia. So though this is the community that we wanna reach out to for, for partnerships. Uh, we meet quarterly. Uh, we've been meeting uh, in a hybrid fashion for the last uh, several meetings due to our, our COVID and workplace environment as it is. Uh, we had our um, a face to face, full face to face meeting at the uh, I2C facility here on campus uh, Tuesday, the uh, Invention to Innovation mm -hmm. facility. And so three months from now, we'll be meeting uh, again, uh, and there'll probably be a, a hybrid meeting. Um, on January the 18th, tentatively. So we certainly want to encourage all to become, plan to be a part of that. Uh, lastly, the, the, the last thing that I wanted to say was, if you have interest in learning more about the uh, partnerships form uh, and also being a part of it, please uh, reach out to Laura Harden. Uh, her uh, email is, is shown on the chart uh, in front of you. So we would like to encourage all that are interested in learning more about Marshall and partnering opportunities to certainly reach out uh, and we look forward to seeing you in January. Thank you much. Reggie, thank you very much. I attended the Partnerships Forum and it was, uh, I learned a lot of things about what Marshall can do and where it might go in the future and how it might support the uh, industry and how the industry might support it with some partnerships. So it, it was a good thing to attend. And even if you think you know everything about what Marshall does, I, you should attend the next one you will be educated. Um, so Reggie, thanks. Let's move into our next discussion. This one is the future of Artemis. So we had the present. Now we're gonna talk about the future. The session is supported once again by our all day sponsors, Boeing and SAIC, as well as Teledyne Brown Engineering. And we'd like to, yes, thank you. That's the little clicker. Um, Welcome to our moderator for this session, Joseph Pelfrey, Deputy Center Director for NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Go. Alan, good afternoon. Please. Went too far. There we go. October 27th, today, this day, 1961, NASA launched Saturn Apollo-1, SA-1, uh, the first test flight of the Saturn vehicle. Uh, had the first stage, LOX RP stage, uh, flew a near-perfect ballistic trajectory, 250 nautical miles. It was the culmination of a three-year development campaign for the Saturn vehicle in the first stage. And it was built right here at Marshall Space Flight Center 61 years ago. Seemed very fitting for where we're uh, at today and what we just heard from the Artemis One panel uh, on uh, our place in history to, to launch SLS, the next test flight. As the SA-1 built on, uh, uh, started a long campaign that led to uh, eventually the Saturn V, uh, Artemis One we know will build on a long campaign uh, beyond Artemis One is just the beginning, and so what we want to talk today is a little bit about what's next uh, after that. So as we get ready uh, <clears throat> to venture on Artemis One and beyond the future missions, uh, we're already preparing for uh, what they will bring: the innovations, the partnerships, 
uh, the collaborations that we need uh, to accomplish those missions. Uh, the teams are formulating what those elements look like, habitation systems, lunar terrain vehicles, environmental control and life support systems, and the other aspects that we'll need, landers, um, robotic precursors. All those things are in work to prepare for those long duration missions. And Marshall's excited to be leading and supporting in, in a number of those elements. We're also working alongside our commercial partners and international partners and in helping them prepare for supporting not only NASA goals, but also the, their own goals. Our teams are working tirelessly to ensure that we meet our current commitments to make those a reality uh, through what you just heard on SLS, our human landing system program. Uh, again, developing those habitation systems we need developing the Artemis science objectives on what we're actually gonna do once we get to the surface. And using the, the, the 20 plus years of experience in doing science on the ISS to really understand how we're gonna do payload operations and science, both on Gateway and on the surface of the moon. So what we wanna to talk today is really what comes next, the future of Artemis. How will we create a sustainable program what are the next things that are gonna come beyond the Artemis One test flight? And what are the architectures and goals that we need to, to meet to go make that a reality? So we have a distinguished panel today that you'll hear from. Kurt Vogel is the Director of Space Architectures at NASA. Uh, Kathy Kerner is the Deputy Associate Administrator for, at the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate. And Pavia Law is the Associate Administrator for Technology Policy and Strategy and also the Acting Chief Technologist for the agency. So we're gonna start off with Kurt to give us an update on where we are with the blueprint objectives and I'm happy to drive your chart. All right, for thanks you very much, there. appreciate it. So <clears throat> to help us you know, talk about the future of Artemis, I think it's, it's useful for us to back up for a minute and talk about how, uh, how Artemis fits into the overall moon to Mars architecture and therefore the strategy behind the moon to Mars um, architecture itself, the methodology and the strategy that we're using and the principles that are, that are behind that. And we talked about, there was a video we put out, I think back in May when we, when we talked about these objectives that we're going out with. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of the folks uh, in here saw that or have seen some, some version of it since then. If you go to the next slide, Joe, thanks. The strategy is guided by a robust systems engineering process combined with these five interrelated uh, principles. And I think uh, I wasn't here, unfortunately, I got delayed uh, getting into town, so I missed, uh, 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 Colonel Melroy's uh, talk yesterday, but I'm pretty sure she probably spoke to these. And if not, if you, uh, I can talk to him more detail during the Q and A. But but these are those five interrelated principles, and you know we're at an inflection point here. There's an opportunity um, to to take a different approach than uh, the way we had been over the last uh, decade and a half uh, since uh, the Constellation uh, cancellation. And so we are shifting from a capability-based framework to an objective-based framework. What comes along handcuffed to that is that once we've established the what up front, let's architect from the right. Rather than build and figure out and integrate as we go, let's architect from the right. The architecture is developed up front to determine what elements we need, and then we execute from the left. Constancy of purpose, uh, that, that's, a, that's a consistency across, that's technical resilience, that's financial resilience, that's political resilience, most importantly. That's part of that inflection point we're at. We have we have this very unique opportunity where two administrations back to back are continuing on the same path. That's wonderful. Uh, unity of purpose. That means everybody inside and outside the agency can articulate and understands and can articulate the vision, the goals, and the top level objectives. And all that is encompassed by the, this enhanced communication and engagement. You take those principles uh, and, and then you marry it up with, okay, well, what does that goal look like? Um, that's the beginning, or actually the very beginning of the systems engineering process is also something I think uh, uh, Colonel Melroy probably talked about yesterday, which is the why, the Venn diagram. I, I think she probably showed that yesterday. That's the why, it's the beginning and the end of everything we're doing. It doesn't start with what, it doesn't start with how, it starts with the why, because that will help drive decisions throughout the architecting process, throughout the whole strategy. So from that why, built on that is the what. And, and some of the pitfalls that you can run into with the what in this strategy is if you make the what too broad or if it's changing, uh, those are all gonna create uh, troubles uh, for you. So what you're seeing up here 
on the left hand side of this is that it's the it's the it's the blue print that 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 one is that, and then we from there, and we can tell you so that. But that's what we stick at. But that's what we stick at. And then we just leave it at that. Say that's what. That's too vague. It's vague. It's a goal. It's very. It's on the farthest right part of the system. And the system is very matrix. But it is. It's it's pretty. What's the system? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we're going we're gonna to get there for the initial campaign, and then from there, it's going to bifurcate. We're going to be sticking, we're going to have plans for sticking around, and we're going to be, be getting ready for the next frontier after that. So prior to the feedback sessions, it was limited to the two reasons on the moon and just the initial campaign on Mars. And what we've done since then is that we've grown it, uh, and, we've, and we got strong feedback from everybody that said, you, we need to expand and at least put the hooks in uh, or have stretch goals to include the, the presence piece from Mars as well. So that you're gonna see that is reflected in the, in the objectives going forward. So uh, when we talk about Artemis and the future Artemis, keep in mind that this is a chapter in a, in a, in a grand novel that we're, that we're all writing together for humanity to build a blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration uh, throughout the solar system. And so with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, or actually, sorry, does that go back to you, Joe? All right, I'll head over to my uh, colleague, Kathy Kerner, who is not only on the Federated Board and the representative for uh, ESDMD's uh, architecture, she's also Jim's chief architect for this whole program. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here. It's, it's quite an honor. Thank you also for all of your efforts. Um, as you heard yesterday um, and even last night um, from our um, keynote speaker, the NASA brand is strong and a lot of that is due to the efforts of people like you in this room, even the students who are pursuing studies in these fields. Um, over the years, the agency has completed exploration studies and been prescribed goals and solutions by various political administrations. And as those administrations have changed, our, uh, our goals have changed as well. As a result, solutions were developed and then repackaged to fit the new goal. Our architecture process, however, you can go to the next slide, um, that we are taking into account now as a result of the efforts from the Federated Board that you heard Spuds talk about, um, those are considering a variety of input, including input from the folks here in this room. Input from um, our analysts, we're doing um, a number of um, discussions with industry as well as international partner, uh, international partners. We're putting together a plan that is evolvable and is based on the inputs from the community, but also takes into account budget reality, new partnerships, and it is an evolutionary process that we've established. When we previously went to the moon, if you recall, we went and we did excursions, and here we're setting up a process by which we can explore not just the moon, but as you heard from SPUDS, we can explore uh, Mars and then other destinations as well. Um, the process that I show here is, is, it's a new process for the agency. It's one that didn't exist before we had this, the end-to-end -end systems engineering in place. We had been doing a lot of analysis, but we hadn't necessarily been broadcasting that analysis broadly within the agency or outside of the agency. And our objective is to take the process that we are formulating now and turn that into a repeatable annual process that then will feed the agency's budget process going forward. So in January of this year, we're gonna hold an internal architecture concept review based on some of the early phases of the architecture, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we're gonna take into account all of the, the changes and the discussions that we've had over the year, including analysis, test and verification, modeling and simulation, prototyping, human in the loop testing, and feed that into the architecture going forward. So our architecture isn't gonna be static. It's not gonna be just go to one destination and do lots of cool things there. It's gonna take into account the technologies that are developed over time, the partnerships, the, um, the communities that evolve over time, not just our traditional international partners, for example, some of our developing countries that have um, new aerospace um, agencies, we're gonna take those into account and our developing industry partners non-traditional as well as traditional. So next slide, please. All that we do in the architecture, as you heard, if you were here yesterday morning and heard um, Dr. Z talking, all of it is with a goal of science in mind and not science as an add-on, but science early on in the architecture development process. So we take into account not only what the scientists wanna do, but also what our exploration and technology development team, teams would like to do. And we break that down into three basic elements, transportation, habitation and life support and infrastructure. And then we develop the elements that are needed to accomplish those scientific as well as those um, technology objectives as we move forward. Next slide, please. 
So this is a lot, a, big, a lot in this slide. It's meant to try to capture the entire um, architecture campaign in one slide. And I'm gonna give it a couple of caveats up front. One, it is notional. Nothing that you see on here is married to any particular contractor or development activity. It's meant to explain the process that we're using with the architecture. The way you read this slide is kind of from the top there are swim lanes, starting with the low earth orbit and earth analogs, which are gonna continue throughout our exploration campaign. We need to use ground assets and low earth orbit assets in order to solve some of the problems that we have going forward. But we also are gonna to return to the moon. You heard the panel previously talk about Artemis One. Hugely excited about that, especially um, since Orion is near and dear to my heart, having recently worked in that organization. But after human lunar return, we're gonna do a segment of our um, architecture, what we're calling exploration, excursions, and evaluation. It'll be a series of missions that go to various South Pole locations looking for the ideal location for us to set up a future habitat or to do in situ research utilization, places where there's resources that we can mine for future exploration activities. Beyond that, then the next segment is gonna include activities associated with research and long duration, um, long duration test missions on the lunar surface that will help us solve some of the human system challenges that we know exist going to Mars. Right now, the amount of data and information we have on how this human system performs in um, microgravity is really only to the duration of about a year, maybe a little bit longer. We need something a lot longer than that if we're going to go to Mars with the technologies that we have today in, in, trans, in propulsion and transportation. So as a result, we're going to try to figure out using what we have, the, the assets that we put in place on the lunar surface, how we can then go to Mars and how the human system is gonna perform as we do those Mars missions when we, there won't be an opportunity to just turn around and come back home in a few days as will be the case on the lunar surface. And then eventually, once we have burned down a sufficient amount of the risk, we're gonna put in place our first human mission to Mars. And I'm excited that that's something that's actually on her, our horizon. It's a, a strategic goal. It's not necessarily a tactical goal, but it is influencing all the tactical goals that we are factoring into the architecture today for um, our lunar Artemis campaign. Next slide, please. There you go. Let's see, our architecture, as I mentioned earlier, really is, um, is foundationally trying to take into account the science community's needs and objectives, which were most recently articulated very well by the, the planetary science decadal. Um, you heard Dr. Z talk about that yesterday, so I won't go into too much detail, but just to mention that what he talked about yesterday is a continuing ongoing dialogue that our mission directorate and the science mission directorate have to make sure that everything that we are doing is encapsulated in the objectives and the needs of the science community. We're also, as I mentioned previously, uh, we're, we're doing a number of international cooperation studies. I just list a few of them here. A number of them are also in work. We have the architecture concept review that's gonna take place in January, which is an internal review. Coming out of that, we will have um, an, an external communication campaign, if you will, similar to what the Federated Board did earlier this year, where we go out and we talk to industry about here's where we're headed, here's what we're doing, and we'll, we'll get the feedback from both, both industry as well as academic partners and our international partners. Also, one of the bits of feedback that we got from Colonel Melroy, and you may have heard if you've, you've heard her speak in the past, is that We've done things and not done a really good job of explaining why we've done things in the agency. And so we're putting together at her urging a number of white papers, just short descriptions on why we made the trades we did for the architecture that we present to you so that you'll have a better understanding. And if the situation or the circumstances change, then we can go back and revisit the architecture. Again, hearkening back to the iterative annual cycle that we're gonna have on reviewing our architecture. And then lastly, we have a number of procurements. I think there are several folks here in the audience who are aware of, of what's going on. Most recently, we're, um, we're, we're pulling forward uh, the lunar terrain vehicle, and we've got some others in the plan as well. So next slide. I just wanted to leave with this. 
I think it was Jeremy Persons on the last panel who said that it's a very photogenic rocket and it certainly is that. Um, I won't say anything more about it because I think they covered it um, pretty well, but I'm really excited about the launch coming up on the 14th. Excited to see um, our first integrated test flight of the Orion and the Space Launch System rocket and learn as much as we can so that the next flight can have our humans on board. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you to Joseph for inviting me to be part of this panel, not only to celebrate um, Von Braun and his accomplishments and his pioneering work, but also NASA. And I'm also excited because I actually have a personal connection with Von Braun in the sense that my uh, father-in-law was the, well, the human factors guy who worked with Von Braun. And more importantly, he was married for a short time to the daughter of Kurt Debus, who was Juan Brown's uh, technical director and, and later on the, the Kennedy Space Center director. So I have a lot of stories from those times and uh, some of them are, are, are fun and hair raising. So I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, so uh, the Office of Technology Policy and Strategy or OTP as that I lead was created in November, 2021 to work in collaboration across NASA and with the broader space community to focus uh, to support our leadership on the on the what the why and the how of NASA as as Bud said if we are doing our job right which is at its core co core research and analysis we are influencing uh, the most consequential decisions about the space sector's future so it's an enormous responsibility that i take very seriously um, as we'd be becoming of a strategy and policy office in my remarks today i will cover three areas that have strong policy equities, landing and operating on the moon, the moon to Mars objectives that Spuds just discussed, and the role of industry, and end with some questions for you. Starting with the first one, the Artemis campaign is fundamentally new. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's almost a cliche at this point, but that doesn't make it any less true. We are returning to the moon with an entire fleet of missions. With the launch of Capstone earlier this year, the campaign has already begun, and it really gets going with the launch of Artemis One, the very photogenic rocket, in the next few weeks. Uh, NASA has awarded multiple phases of the Eclipse contract, with more to come. Our international partners, not to mention the Chinese, have their own missions, and, and commercial actors have exciting plans as well. One that I just recently read about is a company that plans to land DNA-infused crystals on the moon in a commercial lunar, la lunar lander. And of course, there are the crude missions begin with short stays initially, though longer than any we saw in Apollo, and leading to the conduct of long duration science and exploration of the lunar surface, so lunar space and deep space. I know you know all this, but it's important to keep the scope of Artemis in our minds, not only because of the amazing science and exploration that is to come, but because we need to pause and really think about what it means to say, this is something new. At OTPS, we have the privilege and responsibility of asking what that means. And one thing we've realized is that this new era of exploration raises enormous policy challenges in addition to the technical ones that we've already heard about. So here is the nub of it. Between NASA, international and commercial actors, there are more than 20 missions planned to the moon between now and 2026 alone. The moon's a big place, no doubt, but half of those missions are targeting the lunar south pole. And even there, the real targets are likely to be a handful of interesting and accessible locations of interest. I'm sure you've all seen the reporting that China's Chang'e rover is targeting some of the same areas we are, and that's fine. The Outer Space Treaty reminds us that the moon doesn't belong to any one country. But what do we do with that fact? What do we do with the fact that multiple missions run by multiple entities from multiple countries may be operating in proximity for the first time ever on a celestial body? What about the fact that when those missions land or take back off, they may eject dangerous regolith that could harm other actors' assets? What if our, normal, our nominal, or heaven forbid, anonymous operations could be dangerous to each other? What if there are certain locations or pathways that are unique or rare? For example, 
Some pathfinding simulations show that a rover moving across a lunar south pole might have to stay on path that is that on paths that are sometimes only a few meters across to stay in sunlight and, and, and avoid obstacles. If that's true, then we as the space community need to plan ahead. We might need to avoid blocking that path with dead hardware, for example, but we might also need to make sure other actors know about this path so they can take the same precautions we do. Working through these issues is, is exactly the kind of interdisciplinary work that we were created to do. These questions about our behavior in space are questions that humanity has never had to face before. NASA is likely to be at the forefront of managing these problems. So a major focus of OTPS this year has been examining what policy measures might be useful to resolve or mitigate these challenges. A team led by senior advisor Gabriel Swinney has drafted a report that first identifies the key policy issues that would emerge from growing presence on the moon, and then suggests a range of options available as well as steps NASA and other space actors might take. I'm excited to announce that we are releasing this report publicly today. I wanted to read the report, not just the executive summary. I wanted to read the full report, and it's on both uh, the NASA OTPS website and also the NASA Artemis Twitter page. To give a preview, we talk about things like how to design a safety zone, how to manage plume surface interactions, and how to keep valuable transit corridors across the lunar surface available for, for future op operations. And note, I say we don't have answers. I said we talk about, so we lay out the policy uh, option space. As we return to the moon, every action we take will create a precedent. So this, and, and by this I mean how we address these policy issues, matters a great deal. I hope you, you will read the report, and if you have reactions, you know, track me down, give me feedback, and we will make changes. Which brings me to our second activity, um, Moon to Mars objectives that uh, Spuds mentioned. Of course, as you know, as, as Spuds said, moon, moon is not our only, only destination. We remain committed to a robust program of Mars exploration and NASA has a blueprint to get there. As Spuds mentioned earlier this fall, we released 63 objectives that taken together chart a development path for building out our operations on the moon and then moving onward to Mars. These objectives are ambitious, and here I'll say it once again, these objectives articulate things that have never been done before. As we chart this path to Mars and beyond, we want to build key policy decisions into the development process, just as we do with our technological goals. So another project OTPS is about to start just uh, does just that. We are looking at the Moon to Mars objectives, and once again, working with our colleagues from across NASA, identifying those which raise policy issues that may need to be dealt with. But we are not just raising the issues. We plan to identify when in the development process policy issues will actually become important so they are not impediments to development. And so NASA, the United States government, and our international coalition can address them in a timely and thoughtful way. So stay tuned for more on that. The third area where we are thinking uh, is related, obviously, as there are so many of you in the room, is, is industry and the Artemis program. As you know well, NASA is not doing any of this alone. In addition to our international partners, industry will be right there alongside us on, on, on the moon and beyond. Of course, industry will be part of NASA missions, as with CLIPS, but other times, commercial companies will be doing their own missions on behalf of themselves or other companies around the world or other countries around the world. That means industry has some serious skin in the policy game. As industry plays a bigger and bigger role in deep space exploration, it's important that commercial communities examine some of the same issues we are working on, the governments are working on. Obviously, industry must comply with the laws of their home countries, but beyond that, what rules or principles do they want to live by? What best practices would they benefit from? All space actors have to comply without a space treaty, and NASA and our international partners have the Artemis Accords, which take those treaty obligations a step farther towards implementation. But the accords do not apply to purely commercial activities like the space crystal business I had mentioned earlier. Something to think about is whether a commercial set of principles might benefit industry, 
just as the accords have benefited us by provi providing predictability and stability in our operations. Again, this is one of the things we are thinking together with our colleagues from across NASA and even uh, beyond, obviously, to industry as well. Each of these items that I mentioned, landing and operating on the moon, the moon to Mars objectives, and the role of industry is an area of focus for NASA leadership. But these are not issues NASA can resolve on its own. These questions are not unique to NASA or even the United States. Designing and implementing successful policy solutions requires the entire space community and even beyond. An example, when Mars sample returns, uh, uh, return, when Mars samples return from, from Mars as part of the MSR mission, we expect to see vigorous participation from health and biosecurity agencies such as HHS, CDC, and DHS, and the broader public as well. We need your expertise, both technical and policy, and we need your experience to help us all understand the needs of space operators, the risks we face, and what solutions might be most effective. And sometimes these stakeholders will raise uncomfortable questions, some that they wish they rather didn't. But that's the nature of an open society. Values such as transparency and openness, values that we hold dear in our hearts. So we want to hear your questions, and we hope that this can be the start of a conversation today and beyond. To kick that conversation off and to get off the stage, Joseph, I'd like to leave you with a few questions for your own consideration. What do you worry about? When do those worries call for technical solutions, and when do they require new policies? Even more interesting, when do we need a mix of technical and policy solutions? Do your engineers and policy experts know enough about each other's work to combine forces to build those solutions? What kind of precedents do we want to set when we do new things in new places, especially when they aren't about flags and footprints, but long-term enduring human presence? What mistakes from our past, whether it's contaminating the atmosphere with radioisotopes or uncontrolled reentry of space stations, violating planetary protection procedures or others do we want to avoid? And finally, and this is on my mind a lot lately as my daughter is getting to be an age where grandchildren might be in the offing, what kind of future in outer space do you want your children and grandchildren to inherit? What decisions do we need to make now to make that future a reality for them? So with that, I wanna thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think you've heard that the agency has a plan. We have the blueprint objectives. We have uh, the architecture in work to meet those objectives. And we have uh, there are policies in place or working to get in place to be able to accomplish those things. And not just for the students, but for all of us, I think we have homework now. Uh, thanks to Bavia. We have a full report to go read. So everybody gets homework tonight. Um, but as you've heard, there there's going to be plenty of opportunities for collaboration and partnerships for our industry to engage, for our centers to engage. Uh, and, and I'm excited that Marshall will play a key role in that as we go forward. We have the workforce uh, ready uh, through our current and future commitments. Uh, we are training that workforce to be able to work not only in traditional models, but in new models that it will take, new acquisition models and approaches to really go accomplish these objectives uh, that we've laid out as an agency and as a community. Uh, so I'm excited to be a part of that. I really want to thank the panel for being here. I want to thank AES and UAH and the National Space Club for hosting us and allowing us to uh, discuss today. And uh, we will re be ready to take questions. Uh, I have some primers while people warm up if we want, and I'll go backwards. I'll, I'll let Bobby go first. I had a question for her that, um, that I'd like to follow up on. Um, so from your role, what do you see as the most important technology needed to accomplish these objectives uh, going forward? So that's a hard question, Joseph. So I'll give you a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is, I think we, we need the technologies to keep humans alive, healthy, and happy. I mean, obviously we need a host of technologies from power to propulsion, you know, ascent, descent, and EDL, entry, descent, and landing. Um, 
across the board, but I think I think humans are at the center of our explorations. So 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 that's a short answer. But the long answer is that so I'm a, I'm a history of technology buff, and I've looked at the development of you know the Manhattan Project. I mean, obviously the Apollo program, computers, internet, even vaccines, uh, you know, sequencing the human genome. And if you look across, and these are all technology projects, right? If you look across, the the things you find in common are not the technology, but three things, an unwavering will, no starts and stops. We are going to do it. We are going, we have a deadline and it starts from the Apollo program. And you see that in the vaccine operation warp speed, right? There was sort of, there's no holes barred. We are doing this. The second one is, and again, this is, I mean, it gotta get said, large sums of money. Apollo was expensive. Developing the vaccines were expensive. Computers were, I mean, these are all expensive things. And the third one is, even though the performers were commercial entities or industry or international uh, actors, the, the coordination was top-down and government-led. So I would say, in, in addition to focusing on technology, we, we, we focus on those three factors as well. Thank you. All right, the audience warmed up. Uh, first, I have an online question. Um, this is from uh, Stephen Clark from Spaceflight Now, uh, and this is for you, uh, Kathy. Um, from a hardware readiness perspective, what is the minimum time required between Artemis 1 and 2, and how has the delay in Artemis 1 uh, impacted the schedule for Artemis 2? So, Stephen, thank you very much for your question. Um, if you were listening to the last panel, um, the, the panel members there were the program managers for SLS and Orion and EGS. And the traditional you know, number of months that we have quoted between Artemis 1 and Artemis 2 is roughly 24 months. But the team is continuing to make progress in a variety of areas and processing both the, the Artemis 2 Orion spacecraft, but also the ground system modifications that are required in order to have a a safe crew egress system from the launch pad. So um, the teams are, are making progress there and they're trying to um, be ready for once we fly Artemis 1 to get the uh, avionics boxes that are on the Artemis 1 spacecraft, get them off, get them refurbished, and then be able to install them as well as all the brand new um, ECLIS environmental system equipment on the Artemis 2 spacecraft so that we can safely launch um, our Artemis uh, two spacecraft with our crew on board. So um, that's the, the number of months that we've been quoting. I would tell you that there's um, there's some error bars associated with that length of time simply because the team continues to work and make progress to optimize systems and to really challenge themselves based on the um, hardware production flows that they have experience with and then making sure they have enough time to really dedicate to the hardware flows that are brand new to this particular spacecraft. Uh, hi. Um, I think this question's for Spuds, maybe Pavia or Kathy. Um, NASA, I think one of the most amazing accomplishments in history is maintaining a continuous human presence in Earth orbit for almost a quarter century now. Um, my, my entire pro career, um, half my life, I guess, more. Um, when you talk about, when we talk about sustained human presence on the moon, we, we know what continuous human presence in LEO means. What does sustained human presence on the moon mean? Is it uh, do we think about it in terms of the amount of time we could spend there or just the capability to be able to go when we want? What, what does that really mean? It's sort of a, a combination. Good. It's a really good question. And we talked about it a lot. And it means actually the word sustained or sustainable has like three different meanings. And we're actually nibbling it at, at, at all of them. Um, it is a little bit of both of what you said and a little bit more. It's about a continue, the ability to have a continual cadence. It is about going. It's not just even the the human presence. It's also about that when the crew isn't there, that we're able to continue to that we're, we're we have activity that's going on. You'll you'll see in the um, in the objectives. Uh, if you look, there's a glossary at the end. You, there's a QR code that that I'm sure everyone saw in Pam's briefing at the end. Uh, you can go and look. You follow. There's a link all the way at the bottom of that where that QR code will lead you. Now it takes you to a glossary that lists out all the objectives. And at the bottom of that is two pages of the glossary items. So, for example. Uh, there is a difference in those objectives. Some objectives start with the word develop and some start with the word demonstrate. And we mean something different there. 
and I'm leading, I'm, I'm going to a place to answer the question here, but the difference is, and if we're developing a capability, we're doing it for the full operational capability of what we need to fully satisfy that objective. If it says demonstrate, it means we're, we, we want to pull off an initial capability um, and that, that would be the initial demo and then our partners in industry and whatnot will then pick up that baton from there and continue going probably in manifold directions. You'll see that a lot in infrastructure. The, the infrastructure objectives are, are a whole, almost all of them they demonstrate with a couple exceptions, power and, and, and comm, for example, are developed. So the answer is it's gonna evolve. We're gonna, we, the, I, there's some, there are some question marks over that. We're hoping to plant seeds and then let that robust lunar economy, for example, for the moon grow from those demonstrations. So I'm kind of follow up question to that. As further, you know, right now the space station is 100% reach back from a logistics perspective. And you know, the further out you go from the moon and then to the Mars, how much could you, from a strategic perspective, how much can you say you want them to be self-sufficient and then reach back capabilities, you know, from a logistics perspective, how much do you want them to be able to take care of their own problems or, you know, call mama earth for help? Kathy, you want to you want to take that one? I see. If if I understood the question correctly, you're I think you're trying to to help us or ask the question about how much autonomy can and will the crew have. And I'm going to use the same kind of language that you just heard Spuds use, and that it is evolutionary, right? Initially, we're going to take everything with with us everywhere we go, because we have to. We 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 have to take the logistics, for example, with us. But our goal is to be able to harvest the resources that are at our destination and turn those into some of the logistics and the consumables that we need to then have a longer duration stay or in some cases to even develop the commodities to allow us to have propulsion um, capability, fuel and oxidizer to be able to return home, right? So, so it, it's going to depend on how far we are in the evolution of our exploration. But initially, our anticipation is that we are going to be bringing logistics with us. Now, that can only go so far because at some point, when you get far enough away, the delay time in communication, for example, with terrestrial resources, if, if what you want is information, is prohibitive. In other words, you can't solve the, whatever the problem is you're facing because you can't call home to ask for help with it. So you have to have autonomous systems on board that can help diagnose but also solve problems and give the crew the resources for them to be able to solve the problems that we haven't anticipated ahead of time. So that answer your question, it's really evolutionary in nature. You bet. Hi, I am Jerry Lingenthal. I'm the, uh, the Nuclear Energy System Manager at uh, General Atomics. So thank you, first of all, for being here. It's really great to see all of you here and uh, address these topics. Uh, one of the things I didn't see on the uh, systems architecture slide that you presented, uh, Dr. Kerner, I think it's a Dr. Kerner, right? Uh, no, okay, uh, Ms. Kerner, was uh, the lack of any kind of a power generating system. You're gonna need a lot of power for sustained yeah. human habitation on the moon for in-situ resource utilization, for building sure. habitats. You sure there or, wasn't a surface fission power was there? logo I, on there? I, I, I missed it. Yeah. On, one, on one version okay. there was. Yeah, not on this one. I would say, I think it's, it, I think it's on there. Okay, I missed it. Sorry, but but again, that. thank you. Yeah, so again, I'm gonna say what I said when I showed that graphic. It's notional, right? It's notional, it's right, not everything is included. To identify the types of things that we would need, not the specific solution to things like power, for example. Oh. And more important than the picture, NASA is actually putting real money <laughs> in uh, surface nuclear power for the moon. And, and it is reflected, if you go and look at the objectives, you'll see it in the infrastructure objectives uh, listed there as well. All right, thank you. We got one up here. Um, I, had a, uh, I had a question for Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about this roadmap as you go forward. And I was wondering if uh, when you're developing that roadmap in house, how do you um, account for private actors and private companies and other actors, maybe other countries, um, trying to get to that goal and maybe once they get to that goal, you can work with them further during that. And how do you take that into account when you're developing NASA's solution? Great question. Thank you. I think you may have actually usurped Joseph in one of his questions maybe later that he's been asking me about. But uh, so so one of the things that if you notice when I showed the, the process chart, 
it's really meant to be iterative and cyclic, right? So the intent there is to be able to, as we every year do an evaluation of our architecture, we're also taking into account new, I think you use the term actors, um, who are developing things either on their own or in partnership with the agency or other government agencies so that we can incorporate that into our planning and, and purposes. Also, one of the things that we're planning to do is much like what we did with the Federated Board and the objectives is we're going to be hosting workshops where we can talk to industry about, hey, here's our architecture, here's our planning going forward. Give us some feedback on it. Let us take in, take in your feedback. Um, not just with industry, but also with academia and international partners. So we're going to continue that process because we want to have a dialogue about this. We don't want this to be the exploration systems development mission directorate's architecture or just NASA's architecture. This is really humanity's architecture. Right? We anticipate leading the way for all of humanity to explore the solar system. All right, we have one up here on the audience left. Um, Samantha Rollins, again, PhD student here at UAH. Um, my question is for basically all of my life or my professional career, definitely, NASA has taken the approach of failure is not an option. Will this approach be still a part of Artemis? This is a lot of risks we are pushing the envelope. How much risk tolerance do we have? So I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. So first, I'm going to answer for the, I'll say for, for the agency, and then I'm gonna answer for me personally. So um, having lived through several of NASA's um, largest and most dramatic failures, right? Our goal is always to learn and to test and to learn, right? The campaign that we have set up for Artemis, which by the way, starts with Artemis One, which is a test mission, right? Is designed to test the system and test the limits of the capabilities so that when we fly humans, Right? We don't have failures that can't be recovered from. Right? So we deliberately test. We have a, a very rigorous test process. We have a very rigorous risk assessment process within the agency so that anytime we are moving forward or doing things that are risky, that we're doing it in a very measured way and we have tested to the limits of our knowledge and our capabilities in the current environment that we can test in right? before we take that next, I'll say, step in, in risk posture. Again, that's what we're doing with Artemis One as a test mission, an uncrewed test mission. Now, personally, um, there's a quote, and I forgive me because I think the author is Maxwell, but it, it's something along the lines of um, fail early, fail often, but fail forward. If you're not learning from your failures, then you're, the failure basically becomes just that, just a failure, as opposed to an opportunity to learn and to do better next time. Could I also jump in and say that I, I would take issue with the statement that, you know, that's NASA's posture. I mean, take Ingenuity on Mars. It is, it was a high risk mission. It wasn't very expensive. It was a test and it just happened to have worked really well, but it would have been fine if it didn't. So I think, it's that, I mean, with the humans, it's a little bit harder and, and you know, the, 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 you know, the threshold is higher, but I think in our science missions, We've taken a lot of risks and, and you know, some of them haven't worked out and that's a okay as, as Kathy said, we learned from them. I'd like to actually I'd like to jump in as well and, and, and offer even a, a, another angle on the same idea. So I came from DARPA uh, before I, I got to NASA and you know DARPA has like an 80% mortality rate on things. Why? We're taking all these great ideas, throw a bunch of mud on the wall and see what sticks. You know, and that is wow, that's a really high mortality rate, right? It's because the risk posture is pretty high. There's there there's not a there's not a lot of risk aversion, but it's also how you get things like the internet, stealth, GPS satellites, M16s, etc. So it's it, the answer is a little bit different, and 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 where that quote comes from is when with the Apollo 13 incident, right? It's 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 an entire system level crew on board, lives at stake kind of thing. I think what happens is then especially. In, in the wake of certain cancellations of things, there's a pucker factor that all of a sudden kicks in. All of a sudden risk aversion goes up, not just at the system level with crew on board, but now on systems and subsystem levels, all of a sudden there's this risk, risk aversion that we can't take, we can't push a little bit. And, and, and I submit that at those technology levels and the system and subsystem level, as we're developing these things, not for the actual missions themselves as they're going, 
but the development path along the way, you have to push a little bit because if the risk aversion is too high, the timelines are very slow and it becomes very bureaucratic. And you know, kind of the way, the way the government tends to get that that label of you know really really slow kind of thing. We've got to avoid that. And so I think that's there's a there is a misapplication of human safety that all of a sudden can runs the risk of getting applied to the individual system technology areas. One over here. Hi, uh, my name is Wilber Roberto. I'm from the University of Puerto Rico at Maya West. This is a little bit more technical. And from what I've seen, the launch dates for Artemis Space Camp are between 2030 and 2034. And I was wondering that if you hope to learn from that system to develop Martian architectures and Martian habitation systems, is that time frame enough to fully develop a system that can support, say, a notional 2039 mission to Mars? Or do you expect to have more time to develop that system? And also, if you can get a little bit more in that about the development of this space camp uh, for NASA. Okay, that's definitely you. <laughs> yeah, I, if I understood your question, you were asking about a, a date for the Artemis base camp, I think is what you're asking. Oh, for this, yeah. For, so so if you, re, if you harken back to the slide that I showed, right, it, it, those, um, segments of the campaign were overlapping, right? And that's because, right, some of the things that we're developing for lunar systems will eventually evolve into things that we're developing for Martian systems. It doesn't mean that they are um, independent and done serially. In some cases, they'll be done in parallel. So our team has been looking at not just what it takes to develop those systems and the timeline it takes to develop those systems, but taking into account the budget posture that the agency has, as well as the technologies that exist today and trying to forecast technologies for tomorrow. So uh, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball, I wish I did, um, to, to tell you what the future of both our budget as well as technology development will look like, but that really is what will drive the time frame and whether or not there is enough time in that, that notional timeline to get to the, the dates that you're referring to. Can I jump in on this and just share a, a kind of a more simpler example? We've looked at large architecture elements, but one example of where we can try to get ahead of that is what we can use on the International Space Station. Uh, we can use the ISS as a test bed for some of the technologies we need that we need not only on lunar, but on Mars. We just launched a, a new CO2 uh, scrubber uh, called Four Bed CO2 uh, that's operating on station, but it likely will be the technology we use not only for lunar, but on the way to Mars. But we can test that today on the International Space Station and ring it out. So in some things, we can use the ISS for doing that to get ahead and cut down that timeline. Hi, my name is Cameron Geeky. I'm from Ohio State University. Uh, I had a, a question about the, some of the future plant for Artemis that you mentioned about, uh, you know, establishing a continuing presence, being able to harvest eventually resources to look to propulsion and sustaining life up, up there. Um, my question involves, from what I've seen, NASA has been really good with engaging um, with aerospace primes, such as Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, um, Blue Origin, and to develop like the lunar landing system or the gateway. Um, but I, I haven't seen a ton of engagement though with with um, advanced manufacturing uh, OEMs. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> you mentioned that a lot of, you, you know, NASA has a lot of interest in additive manufacturing, for example. But in order to, and, and so some of those technologies that NASA will have to develop while on the moon may, may involve a lot of 3D printing. So does that mean that in the future that NASA would plan to engage with companies like EOS, 3D Systems, or other industrial manufacturing companies to help them develop these kinds of technologies that can then be transferred, that could be transferred to the, to the moon or Mars or, and beyond? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll start okay. out and then Spuds, if yep. you have something yep. you want to say. Yep. So um, some of what you're talking about actually are the technology developments so that are, those are managed by the science and technology um, mission directorate, right? Where they invest 
lots of resources in develop, helping smaller companies develop those technologies that will then fold into some of the elements that you, you're referring to. So my, my suspicion is that you're seeing some of the larger kinds of elements and the larger things and only seeing prime contractors, not seeing some of the subs, right? But you're also not seeing some of the technology investment portfolio that another mission director, not, not mine, but another mission director at um, is investing in to help move those technologies forward to benefit not just the larger aerospace companies, but the agency and some of the smaller companies as well. And so yeah, that, that's exactly, I was going to say something very similar. All, so yeah, uh, the Space Technologies Mission Directorate, uh, that'd be great if there was someone sitting here from them, but they, that's exactly what you'd hear from them saying is that that's what they're built to do. Now there has been, that's part of what this new strategy going forward is there's there may have been either a parent or a real or perceived disconnect between technologies being worked and where, where's the connective tissue into the, well, that's what that in part, there's so many things about this strategy that we're, that we're taking this approach on here uh, that, that are improved and that, that interconnection is one of them. And so if that weren't being addressed, advanced manufacturing, ISRU, you pick one of any one of these develop objectives that are in there, you know, there's going to be limitations, right? At least initially, there might be some, uh, you know, funding limitations to what we can do, but we have to distribute it. But at least we know we've got those objectives established that that for STMD, they've got a goalpost. They know that they, those are things they need to attack. They've got their own vetting process they use called STAR. It's the way they vet the technologies they work on. And so they're going to have their own priorities that are now associated with the overall architecture and ESDMD is responsible for the big umbrella of the how in the systems architecture and feeding that how are those are those individual technology areas that have to those plants have to get water absolutely and if i could add one other thing to that so at the september meeting of the national space council vice president harris tasked nasa to work more closely with the department of commerce to uh, collaborate better on Manufacturing USA and other sort of other manufacturing institutes, and uh, we owe the White House a report on that. So there's more to come. Just I'll wrap this. I think this may be our last question, but just from a center perspective, from Marshall, where we lead uh, advanced manufacturing for the agency, I recognize those companies that you mentioned as folks that we already partner with. So there's a number of initiatives where we can partner in developing those technologies. And it's not just for us to do it in-house, but it's for enable that supply chain to enable those companies to be ready to go build the things that we need to build. So there's a multiple ways that we can partner. You heard from Reggie just a minute ago, I'll plug him in our partnerships office on how you can get in the front door to a center to start having those conversations.